Our second speaker from India, Namya Mahajan, had an issue with her visa. So we will also uh, see her. She was expecting to come, but then she couldn't get her visa to enter Hong Kong. So we will watch another video. But the rest of the panel, are, you are going to see the real person all right, on stage. <laughs> Everyone, it's Everyone, such a privilege to be talking to you today, to you and today, I wish I could be. I wish I could be there, but since I can't, I am recording this from the beautiful lawns of the India International Center in New Delhi. So please do excuse any background noise. Um, so my name is Namya Mahajan, and I work as managing director of the Seva Cooperative Federation, um, which is a federation of 106 cooperatives that are all owned, managed, and led by grassroots women of the informal sector um, in India. So um, I want to use my time with you today to first talk about Seva Federation, um, which is Seva's journey in cooperatives, um, our challenges, our strengths, um, where we are today. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, where we want to go in the future. Um, particularly with digital, with technology, um, and why we're so excited about this new uh, initiative of platform cooperatives. So to start with, um, SEVA is the Self-Employed Women's Association. Um, it was founded in 1972, so that's a little bit over 45 years ago. Um, by Ila Bhatt in Ahmedabad, um, which is the, the largest city in Gujarat, which is um, a large state in the west of India. Uh, so it started out um, as part of the textile labor union um, in Ahmedabad, which was actually founded by Mahatma Gandhi, um, and later grew to encompass um, women in the informal economy across trades. So in urban areas, if you think of waste pickers, street vendors, construction laborers, domestic workers, um, et cetera, et cetera. And in, in rural areas, um, farmers, dairy farmers, who are all informal as well. Uh, in all, more than 90% of women uh, working in India at all are in the informal economy. Uh, SEVA is India's largest and therefore probably the world's largest union of informal women workers. Um, there are now SEVA unions in 15 states of India with a million and a half members. Um, SEVA has also promoted more than 5,000 small, medium and large um, membership-based organizations. So. Um, along with unions, they could be cooperatives, self-help groups, federations of cooperatives and self-help groups, producer companies. Basically, um, we, you know, incubate organizations that are uh, democratic and decentralized, and whatever fits in that, we help to set up, depending on the local context. Um, so. Um, SEVA's approach is of the joint action of the union cooperatives. The union works on struggle with employers, with governments. Um, it advocates for minimum rights, uh, minimum wages, um, decent work, um, you know, a certain amount of leave, um, and access to social protection. It works with employers, it works with governments. But we also saw that struggle takes a long time, right? Policy action can take years, working with employers can take years. So how can we work with our members today to give them you know, better lives, better, um, better work and income and so on? So um, this joint strategy was developed, which was struggle on one hand and development on the other, where um, cooperatives were seen as one form of organization that um, can help to promote the development of members. So SEVA chose cooperatives um, because they're democratic, they're membership-based, member-driven, just like the unions. They also provide a pathway to the formalization of informal work. 
um, for instance, domestic work is entirely informal. But if you have a cooperative of domestic workers, then they can be given um, guarantees of you know certain income. They can be given a service contract. They can be given leave. Um, they can be given social security, insurance, pensions. Uh, the goal of the cooperatives and of SEVA in general is to organize workers for full employment, which we um, define as um, job security, income security, food security, and social security. And for us, social security means um, child care, health care, and insurance primarily. Um, as well as self-reliance, and self-reliance both economically, where they can provide for their own needs, and in terms of decision making. So, you know, they should be decision makers in their own organizations. They should be able to decide what they want to do, where they want to work, and so on. Um, so, a little bit about, again, Seva's history and scale. So, you know, it was set up in 1972, which is more than 45 years ago. The first cooperative that Seva set up was the Seva Bank, only two years later. So, the first need that these women identified um, in their union was access to credit. Um, at the, you know, at this point, microcredit has become mainstream almost in the development sector. But at that time, you know, giving loans to poor, illiterate women, you know, that's three strikes. Um, you would have to be crazy to do it. So, um, so the women came together and decided, why don't we form our own bank? Um, and that bank continues to function. It's called Seva Bank. Um, it now gives loans of 100 crore rupees, which is a billion uh, rupees. Um, it has more than 200,000 members. Um, and it has paid dividends to its members after the first year. So, um, you know, that, that was our first cooperative and it helped really sort of develop faith in the cooperative movement and how it could be part of SEVA. Our first trade-based cooperative was the Quilt Makers Cooperative, where um, you know the raw material, the waste material, basically from the mills, would be used to make patchwork quilts by women. So women provided all the labor, but men sold the quilts. So um, the bulk of the margin was um, in the hands of the people who were selling the quilts, um, and the people who, the women who made them, were paid a pittance. So they started organizing and asking for higher wages, but we found that uh, the women who organized started being marginalized by the traders. They started being blacklisted. Um, so then those women said, well, okay, so we can't work with these contractors right now, but can we make our own cooperative? So Seva helped to promote uh, that cooperative. It helped to mobilize those women, help them get access to raw material, to production, quality control, and then marketing, which was another crucial link. Uh, that cooperative, which is called Sabina, didn't have as happy of an ending as Seva Bank. So when the mills closed down, their source of raw material died out, and so the cooperative no longer functions. But again, it was a way for Seva to learn how this works, what other capabilities that would be required, which led to the promotion of, you know, cooperative upon cooperative. We had 33 cooperatives when the Seva Federation was founded in 1992, so almost 20, more than 25 years ago, um, to provide sort of uh, common needs for of those cooperatives. So some of those are training, both in terms of cooperative values and principles and how do you run a cooperative to regulatory requirements of cooperatives to upskilling in certain technical or vocational fields. We also help provide marketing linkages um, and then some policy and advocacy support, speaking to people like you. Uh, today, there are 115 Seva promoted cooperatives in all of India, um, 106 of which are in Gujarat. Um, the reason the cooperative model doesn't work as well in other states is that cooperatives are a state subject, they're very highly regulated. So in other forms of the country, we've also formed, as I mentioned, self-help groups, producer companies, and so on, uh, which are still based on these, you know, democracy, self-reliance, but 
uh, are not in the legal form of a cooperative. Um, our 106 cooperatives have membership of more than 300,000 women and an annual turnover of 3 billion rupees, um, which is almost 50 million US dollars. Um, Seva's cooperatives are different because these are, as I said, owned and controlled by informal workers. Um, we try to even you know, members who are not highly literate or, you know, conversant with business, they're trained to be able to read balance sheets, to be able to ask questions at annual general meetings, to actually understand their cooperatives. More than 80% of them are viable, which means they can run their day-to-day -day operations, um, they can pay for their own manager. And also, uh, many of them are innovative. So. Um, there could be first ever efforts towards um, formalizing certain sectors or services that you know had always been informal. For instance, childcare, uh, our childcare cooperative, which runs childcare centers for informal women workers' children in you know urban slums, um, the registrar thought it was ridiculous, and he refused to register this cooperative for a while. He said, "Well, what?" You know, what are you making? What will you sell? This makes no sense. So the women said, well, we're selling our labor. Um, we're selling a service. Um, so, you know, we helped create almost the understanding that cooperatives were not just um, a rural form of organization. It wasn't just for products, but it could also be for services like healthcare or cleaning eventually. Um, so Seva's role, which I've alluded to, so I'll go fast, um, is to organize these informal women workers, help build solidarity, um, support the development of their cooperative, um, especially important when you're incubating new cooperative. So helping them, you know, make their bylaws, helping them register, um, your first AGM, your first board elections, you know, how is all that done? Um, then we help, so SEVA has an integrated approach where we think, where we try to link women, as I said, food security, income security, job security, and social security. So trying to link them to um, either SEVA provided or government provided or you know, private sector provided um, services of this kind. And also um, policy action with members, so representing their issues and challenges again, with the government, with the ILO, with other international organizations, with um, initiatives like uh, the Platform Cooperative uh, Initiative. So um, again, I've mentioned this in the past, so I'll go a little fast, but really these cooperatives help to formalize you know, a wide variety of economic activities that had earlier been completely informal. Um, it helps to provide sort of visibility and recognition to them. A lot of women um, do not see themselves as workers, and the world doesn't recognize them as workers either. More than 50% of agricultural work, labor, is done by women. But women farmers is a category that's not really recognized. So helping to bring forward the fact that poor women are actually working women, and they need to be thought of as such to be given certain rights and benefits. Also helping to create grassroots leaders, giving them training and management and leadership, which you know extends far beyond the cooperative to their communities, to their families, they can now you know represent themselves. Um, it's also helped um, the dual strategy of the union cooperatives helps because the union quite often comes to um, you know, the help of the cooperatives, when you have those kinds of numbers, when you have those kind of knowledge of women's issues, it, it makes a difference to the cooperatives. Um, and, you know, it helps in growing women's ownership in assets at the basic level, increasing their incomes. Once they increase incomes, they build homes, they invest um, in credit, um, they have to build businesses, so that really helps them to come forward. Um, that's not to say that we haven't also faced significant challenges. So, you know, resistance from cooperatives, um, d departments or government officials who say, well, you know, these women are not going to be able to run their own cooperatives. They're not going to be able to do this work. Um, 
which continues to be faced even when we have examples of success. Um, changing regulatory environments, so when new laws like GST, which is a goods and services tax, or demonetization are um, introduced without any thought to how this will impact um, cooperatives or businesses that are small or informal. Um, the new economy, you know, the digital economy, the service economy, cooperatives are not seen as part of that. Um, a lack of autonomy for government boards. There's very high levels of regulation in India. Um, access to working capital and assets is difficult because a lot of mainstream banking institutions will not want to lend to small um, women's cooperatives. So helping to link to capital is also an important thing that the Federation does. And then developing management skills for scale. So um, helping to, uh, you know, um, upskill women, uh, informal women, as I said, who have no formal business training, who are not highly literate, and helping them to become empowered and capable of, you know, running their own cooperatives. Um, and I think this helps us segue sort of to um, the digital um, angle of this as well. I think it's important um, to well, you know, um, the regulatory environment changing is essential. Uh, strengthening education capacity building for cooperatives um, and cooperative members and boards and managers. Um, supporting financial viability through business services, promoting public education. And I think, um, you know, digital tools are a very important way to do this. Um, I think technology is important from three angles. Um, firstly, as I said, for um, individual women's empowerment and leadership. Um, cooperatives help to develop women and even putting a phone or a tablet in the hands of a woman um, increases her standing in the community. It helps her access a whole range of services. Of course, um, this needs to be accompanied by education and by training because otherwise, you know, the internet can be in a strange place, as we all know. Um, but um, helping give her access to this rather than through her husband or her older son um, is very important for the individual woman. Secondly, for creating communities of grassroots women, um, a huge problem with uh, creating communities and solidarity in the informal sector is that um, they have no time. Time is such an important resource. So even bringing together, for instance, our domestic workers for a meeting or for a workshop or for an annual general meeting becomes difficult. So can we help sort of use technology um, to um, disaggregate and have like low cost but effective ways of connecting and creating communities. Um, and thirdly, I think um, one of the goals of the cooperatives of SEVA is to mainstream uh, people who are marginalized and sectors that are marginalized. So connecting cooperatives and you know women and communities and sectors of work with the external community, with people like you, with people in India's middle class, upper class, um, to other people to show that, you know, these people are, um, showcase what kind of work they're doing, showcase their struggles and their strengths, um, which will help to, you know, create customers, create champions, which will help us do advocacy work more effectively. I think technology has a huge role to play. So we're hoping through the platform cooperative to create a platform for the federation to be able to showcase, you know, save our cooperatives work to the wider world, their products maybe through an e-commerce marketplace. We're also working with uh, to incubate a beauty services cooperative that will be linked to the digital economy um, almost from the start so that we can um, experiment almost with how a digital cooperative can work and a digital cooperative women can work in a developing country. So there are lots of you know exciting things afoot. 
Uh, thank you for listening to me. Um, if you have any further questions or comments, they can be reached on email. Um, please do get in touch with me. Um, and please have a wonderful rest of the conference. Wish I could be there. Um, and have a wonderful two days. Thank you. Thank you, Namya. Uh, Namya, uh, the SEWA was actually probably the first Asian co-op sign up for the conversation. We are coming, so there's so many people, myself included, you know, expecting to meet her in person. But uh, too bad. We will work on getting her to Hong Kong again in the future. And actually, Trevor just spent some time with SEWA. You know, not very. You know, I think last month. Maybe you will talk more about that work tomorrow in Trevor's uh, uh, keynote speech tomorrow. All right.